some of my ideas, but feel free, you know, as I go along to kind of interject or if you have a question about something, please ask it. So I thought I'd talk first about um, my background a little bit. Um, for a while, I was a full-time film and art critic, uh, first for Creative Loafing, but for other publications. Um, but as you all probably know, there are fewer critic jobs in media these days. So I really don't make my living writing criticism at this moment. Um, in 2009, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution got rid of all their art critics, most of their critics in general for the newspaper. So I work as the Atlanta Journal-Constitution's art critic and occasional film critic, sort of as my side hustle but my primary job is working as an editor and writing and commissioning content for hgtv.com, where I write about a lot of different topics, including design and travel, wellness and gardening. So I studied film theory as an undergrad and as a graduate student, and I worked on my school newspaper and as a freelance writer before and during graduate school. So learning to kind of read film and understand how it makes meaning while also practicing writing of all sorts, both academic and popular, was I think pretty critical um, to my becoming a critic. You're probably wondering what the heck is Felicia the Critic? This is a book um, that I discovered in my elementary school library. That was sort of like a mirror held up to myself as an analytical person. I think I've always been analytical in my uh, regular life in addition to my work life. And it's sort of, this book was sort of a crystal ball into my future profession. I also think on a personal note that growing up in a military family and moving around the world also made me an observer and I was, I became adept at sort of analyzing the codes and behaviors of each place where I lived, which I think also informed my future job as a journalist and writing criticism. So uh, for me, criticism is to, is meant to engage um, with works of art and with ideas. That role, I think, is especially relevant today because we live in a culture that is increasingly skeptical about thinking deeply about unfamiliar or different points of view. And we seem to have a hard time appreciating nuance. We kind of live in a society that sees in dualities and art is really about nuance and shades of gray. I also believe that in some ways addressing issues of race or politics or gender in writing about art is a safer space to engage with these issues than a political or an ideological dialogue. In other words, you can say things in an art review that people would probably tune out, you know, if, if you were some pundit on CNN. So this image is a portion um, of a 1956 Gordon Parks uh, image shot in an Atlanta air terminal. There is a general misunderstanding, I think, of what criticism is for many people who think art critics are a kind of gatekeeper. They serve a regulatory role to decide what is good and what it gets in sort of to um, the art establishment. Um, but for me, art, criti art criticism is a democratic act and a democratic art. It shows that art is not an elite pursuit, but mm -hmm. is for everyone, that it has lessons to teach all of us about the world we live in. But as you can see from looking at this image um, from a 2014 exhibition of Gordon Park's work at the High Museum of Art, there is little value in telling an audience whether the work is good or bad. In a case like this, 
the better story for me is often talking about Gordon Parks through the lens of race in America and how his work taking images in the segregated South on assignment for Life magazine gives us a window into the past that you know, has impact and ramifications for us today. I think an image like this also speaks to the incredible surreality of segregation and how it created these bizarre scenarios of both intimacy and dehumanization expressed in this photograph. Gordon often takes the advantage of the black subjects of his photograph so that we often feel the emotional impact of racism rather than simply seeing a record of it. And this is another Gordon Parks image from that same um, exhibition at the high um, taken and the images are taken um, in the South in the 1950s. So this is a quote from my review um, of that exhibition. What I think I was trying to get at in my review of the Gordon Park show at the high is how we can exist in a system of injustice and cruelty and not even recognize it, try to consign it to the history books, which then allows us to ignore present injustices. Artwork like Gordon Parks keeps us aware of how life is experienced by others and how it is as valid a perspective as our own subjective experiences. And I believe looking at art trains your eye and mind to ponder realities and experiences outside of your own, whether that's a film or an artwork or a book, um, a lot of different ways to have that experience. So what this quote says to me is that what critics do is take a visual phenomenon, a photograph or a painting or a piece of sculpture and break it down. Um, what uh, your professor was describing, describing and dismantling that work so we can better understand the object, but also how it relates to the world that we live in. So in talking um, about an exhibition, things like the techniques and the formal properties of the work, the artist's own life and experience, the historical moment when the work was made and its meaning over time and in our present moment, those are all fair game for consideration and for discussion. So without critics, art, exists in my mind in a vacuum. It's sort of a closed loop experienced by artists and curators and art insiders. And that has less potential to impart meaning beyond you know, those parameters, beyond that small subset of people. Art criticism asks to me, um, whose reality, whose worldview are we looking at when we look at a piece of art? So a critic who's had a lot of impact in my the way I look at art is um, a British art critic, um, John Berger. And he talks famously about this particular painting, Vanity, which is used much like other classical oil paintings to impart a message about death or temptation, sin or cowardice. But in this case is also a painting made within a system of a male controlled art and meaning making where women are the clay and men are the makers and female nudity is presented for the spectators titillation. The superficial moral lesson about vanity that's presented here by the artist is used in a way to distract from the visual enticement. I think you have a question, Felicia, as well. Absolutely, yes, go ahead. I think it was Tito, if you wanna ask your question. Yeah, um, so I was curious, um, have you ever gotten like a significant amount of backlash from one of your um, critical opinions? I'm uh, just curious. 
Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, I do. I hear I've heard from uh, gallery owners and I've heard from artists um, that they felt the way I represented their work um, was not their intention or they wanted me to explain something I'd said. In one case, this was many years ago, it was a gallery owner and she'd had a big sort of group show with tons of her artists she represented and um, I described it as sort of like a jumble sale or a yard sale of art and that was obviously a not welcome um, assessment of this show so she was quite angry we've since made up um, about that but yeah I think if you're a critic dishing out subjective opinion about artwork you have to have a thick skin and also have to be prepared for people coming at you when they don't agree with you. So it's part of the um, nature of the thing, I think. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. So um, what critics like John Berger do, and I hope to do, is question the power structures and belief systems that underpin these kinds of images. Just as we are trained to see the world from a certain point of view by the media or popular culture, which reinforces gender roles or class structures, classical art like this from the 15th century also uh, reaffirms existing power structures. So writing for a local newspaper like the Atlanta Journal of Constitution, I feel like my job as a critic is also to spotlight the work of local artists, galleries, and museums. These are artists I'm writing about oftentimes. They're not necessarily being written about or even shown in other cities. And it is more rewarding for me to speak to their gifts um, rather than propping up a visiting artist who already has some acclaim and has a fairly established career. I do both kinds of writing, but I'm just saying my preference is often to, to talk about what's happening on the Atlanta art scene. My writing, I think, also takes into account Atlanta's unique history, the circumstance of living in the South, of artists making work outside of the major art centers of Los Angeles and New York. So these are some images of artists um, who create work in Atlanta. Jill Frank is the, the image on the left, and then um, William Downs, upper right, and Gerald Lavelle is um, lower right. I really feel passionate about showing the incredible talent of this city's artists and the wealth of creativity right here, if people know to look for it and where to find it. So artists in Atlanta, like Sheila Pre Bright, whose image is, is here, the larger image on the left, um, she examines, among the many things she does in her work, she examines um, beauty standards using a mashup of, in this case, a Barbie doll face and a real girl's face to comment on those unrealistic standards. Um, I also am drawn to work like Angela West's, which is on the lower right um, of the image. Uh, Angela has done a really interesting documentary series about her own father. And it's kind of a complex story about um, the unknowability of a parent, how um, there are these surprise moments that are revealed um, when you're a child that allow you to recognize your parent is an entity beyond yourself, that they have a rich and complex life beyond what they offer to you. And to me, um, her work really peers beneath the cloak um, of what we think we know about our parents to show something deeper. This is her father comforting a cat um, that is sick or dying. I think the cat's probably dying. So those are the three artists in the previous slide. So this is another local artist, Yannick Norman. Um, she has created a whole body of work, really 
strange, slightly terrifying, revealing examinations of America's first ladies. And in the process, she's kind of questioning the feminine ideal that they prop up. The sense of good behavior and American decorum and gentility that first ladies represent that can hide some of the uglier aspects of American life and a power structure whose existence requires a class of people be denied access to power. So Jacqueline Kennedy is so synonymous with a kind of immaculate beauty and decorum that the small gesture Unique uh, offers here of smearing that lipstick is the artist's way of subverting the system itself that defines femininity as only one kind of thing and that holds certain women up as exemplars of femininity while denying others that status. And that's another image from Unique's um, First Lady series. Um, she often you know, takes those images of First Ladies and then adds these uh, sprouting, grotesque sort of organisms growing out um, these anonymous bodies that kind of cover and blot out these famous women and that speak to the multiplicity of women um, that exist outside of the margins of these first ladies um, who, you know, represent just one sort of, of a reality. Just Do we one. know which one that is? Which first lady that is? I think that's Lady Bird Johnson. Okay. No, actually, I think that also might be Jacqueline Kennedy. The I can let you know. Okay, I th I'm guessing uh, Jacqueline Kennedy because of the gloves. She's so slim. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, slim. I, you're probably right. I, I think Lady Bird wasn't maybe quite that skinny, so. So um, when writing criticism, I also take into consideration where and how um, the artwork is presented and how something like a painting by Jean-Michel Basquiat at the High Museum is essentially different from a piece of graffiti art on a downtown Atlanta wall and how that is essentially different than a piece of public art created for a unique location. I consider what feelings that placement, that context might, might create in the viewer, how it kind of determines how you react to the work or the artwork's legitimacy or illegitimacy, how you feel that is an, a true work or not, and how readers should perhaps question what they see as art in the world um, and how they see it. I also write about how work is presented in a space and whether that presentation um, is effective or flawed. I don't know if any of you saw the Banksy show at Underground Atlanta, that sort of thing, how context um, determines how we see that exhibition. Um, so finally, I'm presenting this image by another local artist, Joe Pergini. He's His sculpture of ants um, used to actually hang above um, the baggage claim area at Hartsfield-Jackson. I, I think it's since moved, but he had an installation of dozens of these ants on the ceiling. So I think as a critic, you are continually considering not just the work of art itself, but also the artist's intentions in the work and what the artwork conveys outside of those intentions. Um, Joe Pergini has said his installation of ants, it's called Brute Neighbors, has these insects mimicking the movements of the humans below scrambling for their bags and baggage claims. So it was created to exist in a context at that particular site. Perugini's work is also about human encroachment into nature and also the animalistic and brutal qualities of humankind that we try to deny in ourselves and that we project onto the natural natural world. So there are myriad meanings to his work and the context in which the work is presented can foreground a particular meaning. And I just show that as a way of letting you know the layers that exist in looking at art, you know, 
the the many ways that you can write about it and the many ways it can be um, received by an audience. And that's all I have. So I am happy to um, take questions, elaborate elaborate on anything that you found um, confusing, um, whatever. Thank you for that, Felicia. If you could, um, I'll stop recording.